everybody. So I thought that I would come on here and do a little bit different kind of format for my blog and do more of what they call a vlog, a video log. Uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, because I've been doing kind of more research on painters, paintings, old master in particular, and I have been focusing on this one particular painter whose name is Jan van Hoysum, who was a still life, a Dutch still life painter from the 1600s. He was, and you know, I've been recreating like portions of paintings that I just really loved. And so I thought I would just kind of talk a little bit about what got me so excited about him and what I found super interesting and kind of some of the research because when I start to do painting or any other kind of art project, I don't just kind of pick something because I think it's really pretty. I, I pick it and then, and then it kind of goes into research, you know, in general. So, yeah. So in the 1600s in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, there was a really interesting Thing that was happening during that time period which was like the tulip craze the whole tulip market and if you don't know about it there's a few movies about it and they also um, I'm sure there's tons written about it but yeah basically the tulip flower <laughs> was introduced to the Dutch and they just went nuts for it they actually it became like a stock market item it was an exotic flower and um, basically people would gamble on to to win certain flowers some of them would try and buy the seeds or the cut up cut it like cuttings of a flower so that then they could take it and put it into their own garden um, some people gambled their life savings on it to show their love to you know the person they had a crush on and it just it went crazy it went nuts right and so this this painters these artists too were also very very interested in flowers and in exotic flowers in particular and when you start to think about for example so you know you think about like the silk road and the silk road was not just bringing in textiles, spices, what have you. They were also importing seeds from abroad and flower clippings and, you know, stuff to like graft mm, branches onto, you know, trees that were local. So they might, somebody, a merchant might have brought back uh, a br uh, orange branch, right? From an orange tree and um, a gardener could graft that branch onto a local tree. And then if it was successful, they could take the seeds from that fruit, the orange in this example, and then, you know, be the, the um, sellers of this new exotic fruit, right? And that's kind of what was happening in Europe and a bunch of different places, the, the seed collection and flower collection was a sign of status. And so a lot of, um, you know, wealthy people had these gardens that weren't just, you know, flowers from or plants from local, you know, from their area. They were getting flowers from abroad. They were getting plants from abroad. And it was a sign of status that they could maintain these plants in their gardens, right? They had to find the right soils. They had to figure out, you know, how to keep them alive. And it's also kind of the birth of greenhousing. <laughs> and so because, you know, if they were bringing things in from, let's say, the Middle East, which was a, you know, a much warmer climate, maybe some in some areas it was humid they needed to to build structures in order to house these new plants so um 
artists would actually come, some artists were making enough money where they could buy plants from merchants who were, you know, going abroad and bringing back these, these goods, or they had connections with wealthy families and they could go to their gardens and draw and paint, you know, what they saw. And so I'm not particularly sure if this is the case with Jan Van Poison, this artist that I have selected for a few of my recent miniature earrings, but it would have been the only way that he would have acquired these kinds of illustrations of so many different flowers, right? Because when you look at this man's work, and you know, I have been looking through several of many of his paintings and luckily with the internet what's kind of amazing about it is that you can zoom in and you get all this really 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 fine detail of of the work that he does and it's unbelievable what like how many different variations of flowers leaves that he puts into like a small small area and it's just it's crazy. <laughs> you know, when you look at every single detail, when you look at it, and, you know, also when you know what was going on during that time, you know, like, he got a, there's, he uses a tulip, for example, which what I was, what I was saying at the very beginning was a very, very, um, how do you say this? Uh, desired flower. He got a tulip that was two different colors so it was like red and white and those were extra expensive during that tulip craze right and so and he uses that particular kind of flower in many of the paintings that he does so it makes me think that he had access to it at one point that he was able to either press the flower that you know he acquired or he drew illustrations of it as soon as he got his hands on it because, you know, flowers pass, they die after a while. So, you know, you kind of have to think about how did they keep these things? How did they draw them? How did they record them? And so I, I imagine that he must have either known many wealthy people who would have had gardens with exotic flowers or he would have gotten his hands on it and he either could have pressed the flowers or illustrated it himself and kept like a book of illustrations and you know when you're an artist and you don't have access to the photography like what we have now um he probably would have drawn these flowers from every single angle from all stages of the of the life of the flower so that he he knew how it blossomed and died right um yeah, and you know, he's not the only artist who would have done this. There's there's another artist that I love. His name is Sandro Botticelli from the Italian Renaissance, so he would have been about 100 years earlier. And he also, you know, he was friends with the Medicis, so he was being paid handsomely. But then he was also, there's something that I had read he was acquiring flowers, he had illustrated them, he had kept records of the flowers that he had, you know, purchased from merchants. And one of the paintings, um, it's the Primavera one, has in right at the bottom of the painting, there's all these different flowers. I think there's something like 87 different flowers. And, you know, that was super rare and it would have been like and it's they i read somewhere that it was essentially an encyclopedia of what he had seen or people might have seen up until that point in terms of exotic flowers so yeah the flower thing and how you know now we take it for granted because now we have access to it not just on the computer on the internet where we can see flowers photos of flowers at any time but we can also get them. <laughs> we have, you know, all these greenhouses now. We have this, you know, we're well established in um, that now. 
Whereas before, this was something that was studied. It was some, a point of interest. People were very fascinated by what flowers were and that there were so many different types and so many different varieties and that there, you know, some of them produced the perfumes and some of them produced the poison and some of them produced, um, were edible and some of them produced fruit, you know what I mean? So they were just really, 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 it was a fascinating time and the Renaissance early to late was just, they were hungry for information and so these merchants were really feeding them information by bringing back goods from all over the place, right? So Jan van Huysen, <laughs> um, he just, you know, I have read kind of the surface about him, but from getting an in-depth look at his paintings, um, going through and tracing like the fine details, he just had a really amazing way of putting um, flowers in the background, middle ground, foreground, highlighting them, putting certain colors together. He also had, um, what else was I going to say? He just had an amazing, he was extremely realistic with the way he painted. Um, I have compared his work to other flower painters from the time from a little bit earlier a little bit later and there's just nothing that really compares <laughs> um and i'm not saying that because i'm you know favor him i'm saying that because you know when i was looking at other paintings there's just that the crispness of the detail was not there and with these other with his paintings in particular, he was just really, really, really detailed, really meticulous about what he was doing. Um, and then the other thought that I was having, because, you know, again, we're very privileged to be able to purchase paints, oil paints and tubes, right? So for him, and back then you would have had to acquire the pigments, you would have had to create basically your own mix of oil with a pigment powder and acquiring these pigments was also extremely difficult and I just it and he uses so many colors and is able to just I mean it's such an, a wide variety of colors per painting that it's really incredible um so, yeah, I was, you know, working with him, with his stuff. It's why I wanted to, I didn't realize that I was basically, I felt like I was working with or alongside an old master. And it is the best way to learn in terms of, you know, how a composition of just flowers is put together, right? Uh, he put in a lot of different insects into a lot of the paintings and so when you're looking at things he just he was able to pick insects that corresponded to the color of a flower and it it was just an amazing way of putting things together he also one of the things that like really blew my mind for example was he was he did several paintings with fruit and one of them in particular was grapes and you know how grapes have that kind of dusty little covering over them and that dusting is called the bloom of the grape and it indicates the freshness of the fruit and he managed to m distinguish the bloom of the grape from like maybe you know when you put your hand on it and it kind of that little dustiness goes away it's gone in that one spot I mean he was painting the difference between the bloom and, and where a finger would have held it and placed it. Um, he was just unbelievable, unbelievable. He had, I'm sure he had uh, a, an imagination enough to kind of exaggerate how some of these flowers and leaves were, were, were in real life. You know, some of the petals were 
felt a little bit more than what they would have been in real life. You know, and I, I don't know because some of these flowers I actually, I, I don't recognize, you know. I recognize a tulip because it's a very distinguishable tulip flower. And it's also because I am aware of the tulip craze at that time. Uh, the other thing that's really fascinating about his work and about still, like, floral still lives, lifes, is that they were painting for an audience who knew and understood the symbolism behind each flower. I don't know it, for example, but, you know, some of these painters would, would choose maybe three, four, five different flowers, and they were meant to symbolize, you know, give meaning. I mean, he was using, I would say, as many as 30 different flowers, so his paintings besides actually being layered with all these different things to look at, it was layered with symbolism and, and meaning. And so he was painting for a very cultured crowd. He was, he was, he was very educated from what you can tell, you know, from what I can tell, you know, and he, he knew what he was doing. He knew who, who he was talking to and his audience was very, very specific. And so the fact that he was well known at his time, he was also well to do at the time, which isn't normal for painters, right? Um, he was an anomaly, right? So that is what I have to say about him and his work. So if you ever look into Hoysom, uh, there's some of his paintings at the National Gallery in London. There's some great um, images on Wikipedia, on the National Gallery website. And you can just get really close and look at all those details. And it's amazing. And I'm going to try and put that in this blog post. So it'll be video blog post um, with photos. And yeah, um... So it's been a, an absolute pleasure to learn from this guy. <laughs> and it's been like, it has pushed me so much to, you know, focus on details, to explore, I guess, kind of what, what is around me and what, what a composition could become. Because he really took it to a whole nother level and it was awesome it was so much fun to to work with some of those things to to play around with with you know his colors and to understand what it took for him to actually make these these paintings right it makes you think a lot because we have access to everything right at our fingertips and it would have taken you know so much effort to actually, you know, get the flowers, get the pigments, um, acquire all that knowledge. You're just, I mean, every everything is so new. And so it's, it was a really inspiring and, and fun project. So uh, stay tuned. I think I'm going, I have more paintings that I've been looking at and I cannot wait to share the new work with you. So. Bye.